Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Berman, host of the Cyber Hero Adventures show. We have a special five-part series, of which this is the second one, featuring Bo Woods from CISA, who's going to share with us some unbelievably great things, uh, beginning with, with what's called bad practices. But before we get into that, Bo, maybe you can tell our audience a little bit about uh, the CISA mission and, and uh, why you're there and why you seem so cool. And, you know, I think you have, is that blue hair or? Blue. Yeah. All right. So, the floor is yours. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So uh, CISA is um, the government's new ag newest agency, cybersecurity, infrastructure security agency. Uh, and uh, we really have a mission to kind of safeguard the homeland, safeguard the nation from attack from cybersecurity threats, as well as uh, infrastructure threats, you know, kind of the physical uh, guns, guards, gates, uh, as we talk about. Um, the uh, uh, part of why... I joined CISA is because that mission is really exciting. Uh, and part of why I joined CISA is because uh, I was recruited uh, to come in and do a special program uh, to be here for a year to two years uh, to help improve uh, CISA's ability to engage with the security researcher community, the hacker community, as well as the business community with industry, private sector. Um, and uh, when when I was originally hired, uh, I think I was probably the uh, one of the very few government employees with a red mohawk. And after a couple of months, I said, I got to go CISA blue. So this is now my my CISA blue mohawk. Uh, <laughs> OK, I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't planning on, on doing this, but uh, let me just show you maybe your meta counterpart. I'm Phoebe Fisher. The fisher hunts its prey by pretending to be legitimate communication from a trusted company or from the hijacked identity of a friend, colleague, or family member. Using one of many ruses, the fisher encourages the potential victim to divulge sensitive information such as login IDs, passwords, pins, social security numbers, etc. This information is quickly used to steal money from accounts and to apply for fraudulent loans and credit cards. Is that a soulmate or what? <laughs> um, I, I never knew that that's what I looked like. Thinking, but, uh, well, her name is, is Phoebe the Fisher. And, you know, he's a, he's a 3D prototype that we're working on for like 3D training, metaverse, whatever. And when she's done in her quiver, she's going to have a harpoon for whale fishing. Uh, she'll have a spear for spear fishing and she'll have, you know, a fishing rod for, for spray and prey, which is probably a, an interesting sort of segue, you know, into what, you know, you're referring to as, as uh, bad practices. So uh, we're popping up on the screen here, a uh, link to the CISA.gov website and bad practices. First of all, I love the name. I mean, it's very direct. How did, how did uh, you come up with that? Yeah, so bad practices is something we've been working on for quite a while before we launched it. Um, and the idea was, uh, you know, we keep looking around and we see good practices and best practices and effective practices. And, uh, and there's, there's many, many standards, many, many different lists. Um, but for an organization trying to defend, uh, number one, you get overwhelmed with list fatigue, right? And, and standard fatigue. Um, number two, it's hard to know what to prioritize and what to, you know, bubble to the top. Uh, and number three, um, there's not a, a, a sense of which of these things, which of these elements and capabilities components uh, are well-known and well-trusted um, and are not going to change over time versus which ones might be more temporal. Uh, and so the bad practices is an innovative attempt to try and reconcile that, to give a, a shorter, more prioritized list uh, and instead of saying, you know, um, here are all the things that we think are going to work for you in varying combinations to say, look, here are the things we know reliably fail, um, where if you don't take these actions or if you take these other certain actions, that it's probably going to lead to compromise. And this comes from looking at hundreds, thousands of uh, breach events, thousands of cybersecurity events. Uh, and so we wanted to distill that down to a very, very short list of practices that uh, are conceptually simple to execute, that are relatively unambiguous in their benefit, uh, and that uh, organizations can really pro uh, prioritize and focus on. 
Um, and so this, it's a list uh, that we expect to, uh, to grow slowly over time. Um, we've got three, I believe now is at the time of, of this uh, filming. Um, and those are things that are, you know, relatively, like I said, unambiguous. Uh, most people who are in this field will strongly agree that these are uh, capabilities that need to be present in organizations, as opposed to some of the others that you might get into where there might be varying levels of effectiveness. Indeed. Um, and I, you know, forgive the interruption. And I, you know, one of the things that I've, I've uh, listened to learn from, um, you know, thought leaders uh, about this topic is that a, a very high proportion of um, attacks are, are kind of attributed to very basic things like very basic uh, sometimes referred to as as cyber hygiene um why don't you share our audience uh, with our audience uh, your thoughts about that right um there's a uh, for those who are uh more knowledgeable about cyber security there's a, a great um way of looking at cyber attacks it's called the miter attack framework and the idea is that all cybersecurity attacks follow a certain type of path, right? There's an initial reconnaissance, then there's a, an initial penetration, um, some type of lateral movement, uh, some type of an event, whether that's you know encryption for effect or whether it's exfiltration of data, but they go through these common stages and you can map the stages. If you can map the stages, you can find common choke points and then you can be better able to defend against uh, these cyber attacks. Um, we, uh, as we think about where those choke points might be uh, after analysis of, of lots and lots of this stuff, uh, you find some common patterns of things that, um, uh, that get organizations compromised uh, that are, again, conceptually easy to do. Um, so they're fairly simple and straightforward to understand and implement. Uh, and they make a huge outsized difference. So uh, if you want the 80-20 like the rule, these are the the twenty percent of effort that get you eighty percent of the way, and then you can work on getting the rest of the twenty percent of that way. Um, and those in uh, as we've translated some of those into bad practices, uh, those are things like um, uh, having unsupported operating systems on the network perimeter without mitigations. So uh, it's one thing if you um, have a, a exposed system that has a vulnerability. It's another thing if you have an exposed system with a vulnerability that you can never fix because there is no fix for it, right? So these are um, categories of, of bad practices that really rise to the level where uh, we wanted to, um, to say something about them. We wanted to bring this list out. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also recognize is that this can, can start to form uh, kind of a basis for organizations to look at their third party suppliers and say, well, wait a minute, you've got, you're doing things that are listed on the CISA's website as a bad practice. Therefore, it makes it riskier to us if you practice those things. So it's a way to drive uh, uh, market forces to help address some of the cybersecurity issues that we have, to help decrease the information asymmetry, to make it a, a smaller set of things to look for that makes it easier for procurement officers to understand what to do. Um, this can also empower uh, insurers as right now, the cyber insurance market uh, is in flux. Uh, insurers are trying to figure out how to do a better job of understanding uh, cybersecurity risk. This gives them a simpler, smaller set of metrics to look for and to analyze in order to understand how risky uh, an insurance policy might be and so how to uh, kind of scope and price those things. So um, it helps defenders by giving them a simpler set of things to look for. It helps the market ecosystem uh, to drive out uh, some of the, the bad practices. Uh, and it also enables different parts of the ecosystem to be able to help uh, raise the cyber tide line. 
Indeed. I, and we've had the privilege of working pretty closely with MITRE on some previous episodes. We had one of the uh, co-creators of the attack framework. Uh, for our audience here, uh, not to be expected to, you know, be able to sort of uh, interpret what we're looking at here. Um, it shows the depth and breadth of the attack framework. And if I'm not mistaken, um, have they recently announced or in the... Um, near future kind of the MITRE DEFEND framework, which is the responses mapped to the attack. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I, I haven't followed that as closely, um, but you're right, it's newer. It's a newer idea of being able to map, uh, have a more formal mapping of the defensive mechanisms to the attack framework. They've always had that. It's just been, you've got to, had to go into the details. But I think what they're planning to do is have a, a much more visual uh, and accessible representation of that. Uh, and a lot of those map to some of the, um, the things that CISA has done in the past, you know, not just bad practices, but also like our uh, cyber essentials program and some of the assessments that we perform on behalf of some of the organizations that will call us in to help. Do you uh, charge for those kinds of services? Or, you know, what, what is, uh, like, say we're a small or medium business. I mean, maybe we cannot afford, you know, our full-time uh, IT, you know, staff, that kind of thing. How, yeah. how do the economics of working with CISA work? Yeah, so uh, CISA is a government entity, and what we do is provide uh, a lot of free advice and guidance as well as CISA services. So uh, one that uh, we particularly like is called uh, cyber hygiene. And this is a way to um, get high quality scanning uh, and other uh, external uh, testing that helps businesses defend themselves. Uh, we give it to them for no cost. Uh, they can just come and, and sign up on the website uh, or uh, send an email, uh, talk to one of their local um, regional representatives uh, and get connected for that. And that gives um, vulnerability scanning, application scanning, uh, some wow. phishing testing, so they can protect against Phoebe uh, and all of her nefarious ways, um, which is, uh, you know, normally that's something that a lot of organizations would have to pay for. Uh, but what we found is that particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, they can't afford to pay for those things. Indeed. Um, especially if you look in critical infrastructure, uh, like, you know, I've got a background working in healthcare and, uh, for healthcare, the trade-off is, should we implement this cybersecurity capability or should we hire another doctor, another nurse, uh, bring on another set of, of clinical and diagnostic equipment? Uh, and those are really, really difficult trade-offs. And I think anybody can kind of see why they might tend to favor um, the clinical effectiveness as opposed to the cybersecurity effectiveness up to a certain point. Uh, and then once they, they trip that threshold, then they might... Uh, be able to do a better job of balancing that, but it can be tough and it can be tricky. And so uh, one of the things that, that CISA wants to do is really help those organizations uh, who are the, as we call it, the, the target rich cyber poor. So they uh, have a lot of potential risk if they are harmed through cyber attack, but they may not have the uh, technical capabilities, the experience, um, the economic advantages to be able to bring in, uh, you know, a large cybersecurity property or a state or, you know, a lot of defenders. Uh, mm -hmm. And CISA wants to be able to help bridge those gaps. Indeed. And uh, we're going to be um, going into a great deal of depth uh, pertaining to the healthcare sector in uh, the next edition of our five-part series, uh, which is focusing on ransomware. And unfortunately, you know, the criminals and uh, threat actors are, uh, taking advantage of COVID and, and things like that. And um, so uh, stay tuned. How does our audience get more information about some of the great things that you're doing at CISA? Yeah, so uh, just come to the, the CISA website, CISA.gov, C-I-S-A.gov, uh, and check out some of the things we're doing, including the bad practices, including, as you alluded to, StopRansomware.gov, some of the ransomware resources that we have, or uh, get in contact with uh, some of the CISA field offices, some of the regional uh, folks on the team uh, who can sit down and provide that kind of trusted advisor capability to your organizations. Indeed. Well, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, thanks uh, to you, Bo Woods, and everyone over at CISA and, and all the unsung cyber heroes who toil in anonymity to keep us safe. Uh, thanks for who you are and what you do and why you do it. Stay tuned for our next show.